Welcome, church, on this 4th of July weekend. For those of you that are not traveling and are with us, we are excited to worship with you. Let's stand as we join together, worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Helps to plug in. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you. We are here for you. To you our hearts. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. Let our shout, let our shout be your anthem, your renown, fill the sky, we are here for you, we are here for you, let your word move in power, let your word move in power. Let what's dead come to life. We are here for you. We are here for you. To you our hearts. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. your fire fall down. To you our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. As we open our hearts to him today, as we invite him into this space, we lift our hearts and our voices to praise him so that our praises resound throughout the earth. We welcome you. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcomed in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome. Let every heart adore. Let every heart adore. Let every soul awake. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. I'm Riley, and I just wanted to welcome you and thank you for joining us for the service today. We are so glad that you're here. Jeremiah 17, 12 to 14 says, A glorious throne set on high from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise.
think about how our lives have been changed it is not only that he is the lamb but he also fights on our behalf Moses told the people just hey you know what let God do the fighting on your behalf and he will take care of it that's my paraphrase but I love it he says God will handle this and he truly will so as we think about what God has done this week and will continue to do in our lives this week let us think on those things and give him that praise Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God, 
is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Sing and open up the gate. Open up the gate, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring. Power and fighting our battles, every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow be who can stop. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Sing Who can stop? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. You may have a seat. Well, hi, Harvest. It is good to see you uh, on this holiday weekend. And I have a special thanks to Bill and Georgia and Sabrina for moving to the middle because otherwise it was like over here and over here. And I'm sure that uh, that's gonna be appreciated later tonight as well. So um, we are glad that you are here, whether you're with us in person or online. And we are um, especially excited to see you when you are able to be here. I know a lot of folks traveling and those sorts of things that are typical of the summer. So uh, if you're able to be here, we're just glad to see your face, uh, your smiling face. If you are new, and uh, you have never received a welcome from us before, you can do that by sending us a text that says welcome. The number's on your screen, 559-245-6200. And uh, if you'll send us a text, we'll just send you a little bit more information about who we are and, and when we meet and things like that. And you can be prepared to join us uh, the next time we're together. Um, if you are someone who has uh, made a commitment to harvest and you are giving we're continuing to do that giving online and you can do that by visiting our website um, and hitting the, the button up in the corner that says give and then the instructions will be right there you can do that on a one time each each time separate sort of basis or you can set it up and it will automatically do it for you uh, as frequently as you tell it to do that so uh, we'll continue to give in that way and uh, and we have a new announcement tonight, and that is about our children's ministry. As we have been meeting again uh, together, 
We have uh, tried to restore some of our important support ministries, and obviously really important is our children's ministry. Uh, that's been uh, led a lot by Shauna Guzman in recent weeks, and she has some good volunteers, but she needs some more. She's getting a little tired, and, um, and that happens quickly. If you're in children's ministry, you know that. But they meet upstairs uh, each week, and uh, if you are interested in helping out, there's the information for getting a hold of Shauna by email. If you know her personally, you can just find her. You can wander upstairs after the service where the kids are and say, hey, let's talk and uh, get a chance to uh, maybe get set up and join that team once a month or something. So uh, just talk to Shauna about it, and she'll get you set up for that. Tonight, Pastor Ben is uh, on vacation with his family, um, and uh, they'll be back soon. But um, we have a guest speaker, an old friend with us tonight, Dr. Jim Cece. Uh, Dr. Cece is a pastor at Campus Bible Church, and he has been an invaluable resource to Pastor Ben and to our elders, just giving us counsel again and again in recent years, and we really appreciate that, but we also appreciate the way that he teaches the Word, and so we're always excited when he can be with us. Um, I think you'll be... Um, really interested in what he has to say tonight. Um, I think there's a lot of things we could say about him and some of his background, but I think on this weekend, I want to give him one of those shout-outs to somebody who served our country uh, in the U.S. Navy uh, back in the Vietnam era. And, uh, and so this is a special weekend, I know, for those who have served. And um, I know, I know that your heart for the last 40 years has beat for a different kingdom a much higher kingdom, but uh, that service is really appreciated too, so thank you. All right, let's pray, and then Pastor Jim will come. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Uh, we have been singing about it already tonight, the power that you have and our desire uh, to be submitted to you. Every knee will bow before you, and you know, we do that in a way tonight um, when we come to your word, and we ask that you would give us hearts of of understanding and hearts of submission and hearts of response as we hear uh, your word taught. It's a living and active word, and we ask that it is alive in us uh, tonight and going forward, that what Pastor Jim teaches tonight will linger with us and train our souls and uh, cause us to do the things that are pleasing to you in your kingdom in the days and weeks and months ahead. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, good evening to all of you. Good evening. Um, when Pastor Ben called me a couple of weeks ago and said, do we have anybody that can preach while he's on vacation, uh, I volunteered. I, I said, if you don't mind, I, I would love to come because I love your church. I do. Uh, this is one, and I love your pastor and uh, love his family. But what a privilege to be here uh, to share I don't get to have to preach tomorrow, which is nice, so I get to, this is my weekend opportunity. So I'm going to be here till midnight just preaching. I hope you stick around for that. So, so happy Calvinist Fireworks Day, you know, where it's about predetination. I'm sorry, that's a really, really bad joke. I heard it this afternoon, but I want to invite you if you came to that. By the way, I have uh, six of my 14 grandchildren uh, with us as my peanut gallery tonight, so it's good to have Jamie and them with us, and uh, I, you know, it's a lot of fun. We're going to spend a lot of time together in these coming weeks during the summer months as well, so it, what a joy to be with you. If you have your Bibles, will you turn, please, to the book of Romans? If you don't have your Bibles, may God have mercy on your sin-sick, shriveled-up soul. I know that this is a Bible-loving church, so I love having the Word of God, whether it's electronic or in printed form. It doesn't matter to me. But I want you to also take out those study outlines that we provide for you. You will need that to follow along. Uh, and I want you to turn to Romans chapter 12. The 12th chapter of the book of Romans. You know, one of my favorite TV shows is called Survivor Man. 
where a Canadian survival expert by the name of Les Stroud puts himself on all of these life-threatening ordeals without food, without water, without shelter. Now, you've got to know why somebody like me would like something like that because I am fundamentally a, a city boy. I have concrete running through my blood. I am not a backpacker. I'm not an outdoorsman. I'm not a wilderness wanderer. Uh, I am interested in being prepared. I was a Boy Scout, but got kicked out within six weeks of being a boy. How do you get kicked out of being a Boy Scout? But apparently, you're not supposed to fight in uniform. uniform. I did not know that that was a part of the Boy Scout code, uh, but that's why I got kicked out. So God has changed my life since then, but I did learn the motto of the Boy Scout. What is it? Be prepared. I have been in situations where we've lost electrical power for about a week, and we were prepared not only to help ourselves, but to help our neighbors who were very unprepared. I've been in disasters and where mudslides, for example, threatened our home and people in our church lost their lives. I've experienced that. But we were prepared to evacuate at any moment. In fact, our home became an evacuation center. I've experienced earthquakes and tornadoes and lightning storms. And, of course, the recent wildfires here in our area have certainly got our attention, have they not? I'm a little bit concerned about this weekend of fireworks, to be honest with you. I hope you'll be especially careful if you're going to do that. But we have food and water stored, and, and we never let our gas tank, tank go be below one half, ever. No one in my family is allowed to do that, just in case we have to leave the area in a bug out. You know what a bug out is. Uh, in fact, I want to show you one of my go bags. If I can reach down here and get this. But this is one of my go bags. Now, let me tell you something about go bags. They should never weigh over 20% of your body weight. So, but you've got to be able to survive for 72 hours with this little go bag. Whatever you'd need. Which is not your television, it's not your tablet, it's other fundamentals that you would need. But in that spirit of being prepared, the ultimate disaster plan, of course, is to have a map of all the preppers and just go to their houses. So I'm going to pass a clipboard around to all of you real preppers, and if you'll just give me your address and then maybe your credit card number and your PIN number, that would be awfully helpful for my particular long-term survival plan, if you will. But obviously, disasters do happen. They're classified into three types, natural disasters, man-made disasters, and a combination of the two called hybrid disasters. It's on your outline. Listen to this carefully. A disaster is any serious problem which exceeds our ability to cope using our own resources and requiring us to call for help from others. So in that sense, we have to include the most common life-challenging situations, and that's our personal disasters, what I like to call the, the tiger stories, the tiger attacks in all of our lives, like a crisis in our health. Maybe you're suffering a, a life-threatening illness right now or a medical emergency that you've experienced. Or crisis in our personal relationships. Maybe you have a conflict in your marriage or, or your family or your friendships or even in the workplace or, or at school. Or even a crisis of faith. Maybe you're filled with doubt or discouragement or division or you're especially facing right now in your life persecution. Tiger stories that you all could share. But let me tell you that our lives are filled with disasters in which we won't easily survive without a clear plan. These tiger stories, if you will, basically pose their greatest danger by showing up in joy-stealing hopelessness, strength-depleting tribulation, and resource-consuming needs. So I want to talk about being prepared for any kind of crisis. I'm not talking about electri electrical power. I I'm not talking about a natural disaster. I'm talking about any kind of crisis. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 12, Paul addresses this. We are going verse by verse, phrase by phrase, word by word, and precept upon precept through the entire chapter of Romans 12. I want to just take you through one verse. 
It's not isolated. There is context, of course, in Romans chapter 12. When Paul begins by saying, I appeal to you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, and so forth. He goes on to talk about what it means to be dedicated to service in Christ. But in Romans 12, verse 12, he makes this statement that's so easy to read and so hard to do. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, and devoted to prayer. Can you read that with me, everybody? Say it out loud. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Obviously, if we had the time, I could take you through a timeline of the Apostle Paul's life, a, a series of personal disasters. His own tiger stories are recorded not only in the book of Acts, but throughout his 13 epistles, his tiger stories. He suffered a chronic illness that he called a, a thorn in the flesh. He, he had a health crisis, unnamed and unknown. He experienced numerous beatings and stonings and even a couple of shipwrecks. I was in the Navy, and I, I thank God that I never had to experience a shipwreck. His ministry was filled with false accusations and false imprisonment. Even some of his co-workers betrayed and deserted him. So talk about a man who could have easily succumbed to joy-stealing hopelessness, strength to pleading tribulation in the midst of resource-consuming needs. Talk to any survivalist. He'll tell you the greatest threat to survival is the wrong attitude. The key to survival in any crisis of any shape or imagination is to have your focus in the right place. I don't know what crisis you're facing or will face in these coming days. But I love Paul's attitude recorded in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10, when he says, Therefore, I delight in weaknesses. Uh, the, the Greek word is the word dio, di, um, dokeo. It means to, eudokeo, rather. It means to be, I am well content. In fact, its root means I'm well prepared in weakness, in insults, in distresses in persecutions, in difficulties, in behalf of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And you've got to ask the question, given all that Paul faced, how in the world could he do that? He was a normal human being like you and me. But here in Romans 12, verse 12, he presents for us what he practiced in his own life, what I like to call spiritual survival tactics. Look at your outlines for a minute. Romans 12, verse 12. But let me remind you of Paul's familiar words first. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. So often read, so rarely lived. Would you read it with me, everybody? No temptation has overtaken you except something common to mankind. And God is faithful. So he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. I, I want to give you my personal paraphrase. No human disaster has overtaken you that others have not faced. And God is faithful, so he will not allow you to face anything beyond your capability, but in every situation will provide a way of escape. Why? So that you will make it through. Everybody say, make it through. In my office at Campus Bible Church, I have what's called a CERT manual. Uh, it's the Community Emergency Response Team manual. It provides instructions for a variety of emergencies at home, at church, in the community, and even at work. But I have in my hand the ultimate emergency response manual, and that's the Word of God. It provides the instructions to keep our attitude strong in a variety of personal disasters. And so I want us to look closely at this verse so easy to pass by, so commonly read, so rarely applied. Romans 12, verse 12. 
And I want us to consider being prepared for personal disaster. Number one, joy-stealing hopelessness. Because there will be times in our lives when we will come to a place of feeling helpless. And any survivalist will tell you that succumbing to those feelings of helplessness can lead to feelings of hopelessness. And then ask that same survivalist, and they'll tell you, and hopelessness leads to death. Giving up in any crisis, physical, emotional, spiritual, leads to death. It can kill us physically, it can cripple us emotionally, and yes, it can even incapacitate us spiritually. Do you remember Psalm 42? We love to sing about that song, as the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you. And we say, oh, isn't it wonderful? No, read the rest of the psalm. This is a man who has given up on God. He says, I used to go along with the throng. I used to lead a procession in praise to the household of God. Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? He's talking to his soul. Why are you disturbed within me? And then he says, hope in God. People are saying, and where is your God? He's saying, I don't know. And then he says, but I will yet praise him. God, I can't praise you now, but I will. You ever been there? You ever been at that point where you say, I don't feel like praying, I don't feel like praising? And I may be saying, praise the Lord on the outside, but inside I'm going, where are you, God? You took a coffee break and never came back. You ever felt that way? That's your tiger story. And that's your personal disaster. And you're not alone. In 1 Timothy 1.9, Paul observed the sad state of those people who suffer shipwreck in regard to their faith. You know, their, their faith is sinking because of some real or maybe even an imagined crisis. I've been in the ministry since 1974. That's a really long time, Jeff. I am really old. And you already guessed that when the moment you saw me. But I've observed three kinds of people in my churches. The first are what I call the VNPs, very needy people, who admit they need hope and will gradually receive it, and gratefully so. But then there are the VHPs, the very helpful people who readily distribute hope to others, all right, and, and, and have enough hope to share it with others. Ah, sadly, there are the VDPs, the very draining people who refuse hope even when hope is readily available. In fact, they rarely help themselves. They simply depend on others in crisis. They're quick to tell you they're in trouble. Oh, they're quick to tell you. They're not quick to do anything about it except say, what are you going to do about my crisis? And unfortunately, they're addicted to hopelessness. Their lives are in constant fear of disaster and crisis, even when there's no imminent danger. The book of Proverbs describes this person that says, and what they fear will come upon them. Maybe not in reality, but in their imagination. The sky is falling. No, it's not. I feel it is. It must be. And too many people in the body of Christ are addicted to hopelessness. They're addicted to chaos, and they resist any attempt at preparing their lives to face a real disaster. In fact, what they're prone to do is to consume the hope that others have. They're hope suckers. They suck it right out of a body, right out of a church, right out of a family. Now, all of us, VNPs, VHPs, VDPs, we need to listen to the Apostle Paul. Survival tactic number one, so simply stated in Romans 12, 12, Rejoicing in hope. Everybody say it. Rejoicing in hope. I've spoken many times, as I know Pastor Ben has, about the importance of hope this side of heaven. It's one of the greatest needs in the body of Christ today. COVID did not do us well in the body of Christ. It sucked our hope. And if we're not careful, it will continue to do so. The aftermath of COVID-19 is hopelessness if we're not careful. I want to remind you of my definition of hope. I hope you'll take this to heart. Biblical hope is the eager expectation that God will do what he promised in the future, and then it's living as if it'll happen today. Can you read that with me, everybody? 
Is it up there? We got it? Maybe not. Maybe not. Is it on your outlines? Read it with me. Biblical hope is the eager expectation that God will do what he promised in the future, and then it's living as if it'll happen today. See, believing in the importance of hope isn't enough. Singing about hope isn't enough. Rejoicing in hope is the issue. Not just believing that hope is possible, not even just believing that hope is real, but rejoicing in that hope. When I counsel people often, I'll take a piece of paper and I'll cram 12 letters together. It's on your outline there. G-O-D-I-S-N-O-W-H-E-R-E. It can be seen two ways. All right, the first way is God is nowhere. That it feels like God just left us. And you're not alone. Many of the psalmists felt that. That, you know, and you want to say praise the Lord, hallelujah, but you know the truth is you're just saying, God, where are you? And other people are looking at us and saying in the spirit of Psalm 42, and where's your God? Ah, but then you come to your senses biblically, your theology about the presence of God, that God is now here. Everybody say, God is now here. That's not just a theology. It's an attitude. See, biblical hope is not wishful thinking. It's holding on to the promises of Scripture. Romans 15, verse 13, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, in trusting, in relying on Him. Why? So that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit in any situation. How many of you saw the Tom Hanks movie, Cast Away? Do you, do you remember that movie? And do you remember the scene when he's, rubbing two sticks together, which, by the way, is a very difficult thing, let me tell you, very difficult to light a fire with two sticks, so you better be prepared, all right? And I say that to you. But remember when he finally lights the, he finally lights the fire, and what does he do? He, he pounds his chest, fire! I have made fire. Remember that? All right, that was my best Tom Hanks imitation. It doesn't get any better than that. But in the midst of a disaster, when God helps us to see that He is now here, that's a chest-pounding moment. God, you have given me hope. I have hope. I believe you will do what you promised, and I will trust in you today. And do you know how contagious that is? But so is panic. So how do we learn to rejoice and hope in the midst of, of crippling difficulties, of personal disasters, in the midst of our tiger attacks, physically, emotionally, and spiritually? Well, number one, before they even come, you better be a man or woman of the word that has read about people who handled life well in the past. Because I want to tell you what your Bible is. It's a disaster prep tool. That's what it is. Romans 15, 4, Paul says, for whatever was written in earlier times, you know, those other stories, was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scripture, we might have hope. When you're in a disaster, you don't have time to open your Bible. You hope that you can do that, but you better have already had time in the Word of God so you got plenty of examples of people to handle their own crises. Secondly, we need to be around those that rejoice in hope today, even outside of the Bible. My sister-in-law, Marcia, happens to be one of my favorite people on the planet. Besides being a great sister, in fact, I'm closer to her than I am to my own sisters, and yet she's a sister-in-law. She was a bookkeeper at Jaron Ministries for 23 years, but, but she was just my sister. And a great lady. And she's presently battling stage four pancreatic cancer. So her tiger story is certainly evident. But I want to tell you something. It amazes me how she's handling it. It doesn't surprise me. But it amazes me. The hope that she has. And the promises of God. See, in the, in the past, the, the promises of God in our many disasters prepares us 
for what's coming next. Because God is now here. So sometimes you have to rehearse what God has brought you through. Sometimes we are in the middle of a disaster and we're hyper-focused and the moment that God takes care of us, we move on and life gets back to normal. But you're not normal, you're different because you have more evidence that God is now here. God has placed people in our lives and he's also allowed us to go through things so that we might rejoice in hope. See, let me say it this way. Rejoicing in hope is a personal disaster survival tool for dealing with our joy-stealing hopelessness. So you pack your spiritual go bag with personal testimonies, your own and others. Testimonies, reminders. But I want to move on to personal disaster number two. That strength-depleting tribulation. I mean, let me just tell you, the, the Bible is very honest about life this side of heaven. In, in the words of the musical, it's made up of trouble, 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 trouble with a capital T. You know it, I know it. And in particular, there's another word in the Bible that starts with a T, and that's the word tribulation. And Jesus said, in the world you will, that's a promise, have tribulation. Put that on a bumper sticker. That's a promise. Paul said, yea, all who desire to live godly in Jesus Christ shall suffer persecution. That's a promise from the Word of God. When you stick your head above a crowd, somebody's going to throw a brick at it. Settle it. And here in Romans 12, verse 12, Paul says, I want you to be persevering in that promised tribulation. And the Greek word that he uses for tribulation is the word thalipsis. It's a very graphic word. It's a word that means to squeeze like a grape or place under extreme pressure or to be hemmed in. It's actually a word that describes execution in the first century because when you stone somebody, folks, you didn't throw pebbles at them. You put a giant rock on their chest and it crushed their chest so they couldn't breathe and the other stones were symbolic. Have you ever had a chest-crushing tribulation in your life, followed up by insults and misunderstandings and the other pebbles that come? Oh, how that describes so many of our life circumstances, where we're compressed, restricted, squeezed, placed under extreme pressure, and faced with chest-crushing problems, and Paul understood. That's why he lays out a survival tactic for it. Number two, persevering in tribulation. And this should be a familiar word to you because I believe the last time I preached, I talked about this same word, persevering, or hupomeno, and the noun form of hupomone. And hupomone sounds like a heap of money. Let me tell you, you can have a go bag full of $100 bills and not survive the next tiger attack. It shouldn't be filled with a heap of money. It needs to be filled with hupomone. That steadfast steadfastness, that enduring endurance, that stickier stick to itness, you know? Because I want to tell you, disaster experts remind us often that in any dangerous situation, giving up is fatal. That's why God gave us that flight or fight drive in us to not give up, to keep on keeping on. Do you remember the story of the man who was crushed by a rock, his arm was, and he had to use his own pen knife to cut his own arm? You know what motivated him to do this? his wife and kids back home and not giving up. Now, you and I may never have to go through such extremes that the principle is stated in 10 Corinthians 4, verse 8 and 9, when he says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not abandoned, and struck down, but not destroyed. Remember, Winston Churchill said it well when he stood before a crowd of people before America came into the war. And they were losing. Britain was losing. And he said, never, never, never give up. It gets shortened to never give up. But those were his exact words. See, in the midst of our cr chest-crushing tribulation, Paul is calling us to persevere in tribulation. Why? Because persevering in tribulation is a personal disaster survival tool for dealing with our strength-depleting problems. And just as whining is contagious, so is hupomone. I mean, just go to a play yard and a bunch of kids are screaming, ah, ah. 
And your son comes to you and he starts screaming. He says, why are you screaming, son? And he says, I don't know. They are. They are. But just as running in panic is contagious, so is persevering in tribulation. So how do we learn it? Well, one, we learn it from others. Hebrews 11, remember that wonderful list of people who by faith endured great challenges? And if you haven't read the Bible, Hebrews 11 doesn't make any sense. It's just a bunch of names splattered all over a chapter. So there's backstory to every single one of these people. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua at the walls of Jericho. Goes on to list Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. And then it speaks of others who, whose loved ones died, some who were stoned, others who were put to death, and then even those who were destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, wandering in deserts and mountains, and even living in caves and holes in the ground. And if you haven't read your Bible, it's not in the movie. You're going to have to read the book because you're going to need it. Do you remember the familiar words of Hebrews 12, 1 and 2? Therefore, since we also have such a great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with hupomone, perseverance, endurance, the race that is set before us. Maybe for you it's a marathon. For me it's a sprint. For you it's a hurdle. For me it's a half mile. Looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him, hupomone the cross. He endured it, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There are people throughout history who have been our prophets of Hupomone and even Christ. And guess what? He's placed those same prophets of Hupomone in our midst today. They are a cloud of witnesses. You have people in your life surrounding you who have endured their own tiger attack. But then we also learn it in the midst of our own trials. Paul said in Romans 5, 3, and 4, we also celebrate in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about hupomone, perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character what, everybody? What's the last word in the line? Hope. Oh, how we need that. Because trials are perseverance factories in our lives, and that's why Paul says, I want you to celebrate them. Not asking you to be a Christian masochist, oh God, beat me, hurt me. But you celebrate your tiger stories, your disasters, because you didn't just go through it. If you did it the way Paul is telling us to do, you have grown through it, even the smallest challenges in our lives. And guess what happens? I promise us this. Not based on my opinion, but on the authority of the Word of God. That when you handle the little ones, you'll be ready for the big one. And I don't know what the big one looks like. Because I'm not a panicker. I think that one of the big ones is that hope will be sucked out of the church of Jesus Christ. And that will be one of our major disasters. Back to Romans 12. Number three, resource-consuming needs. I mean, we're all very needy people, right? We're going to run out of something. We're going to run out of food or water, but what I'm most afraid of is that we run out of hope. Well, isn't it interesting that in the midst of threatened disasters, real or imagined, how people run in all these different directions? Some people panic because they're unprepared. They panic by hoarding everything from toilet paper to batteries to gasoline. And here's their mantra. The sky is falling and I'll push aside anybody to keep it from falling on me or my loved ones. How godly is that? Other people do nothing. Relax, people. This ain't no big deal. It's not a real disaster. And if it is, someone's going to rescue us, especially the government. Eat, drink, and be merry. Maybe tomorrow we'll die. Others are prepared just in case it's a real crisis, and if not, it's good practice when the real disaster comes. Well, so it is with our spiritual needs, our, our tiger attacks, 
Some panic, some ignore it, but all of us need to do what Paul suggests. Number three, survival tactic number three, being devoted to prayer. Emergency supplies should have a number of forms of communication. Your mobile phone and solar-powered batteries and on and on, but you may be out of range or the phones will be overloaded. You won't be using that, so you got to figure out what you'll use. Some people say, I'll pack a mirror. That's fine, or a colored tarp. All right, good. Or at least a marking pen so you can mark down numbers. You should always mark down, by the way, a side note, the names of your children, their blood type, and their phone number on their arms. So that if they're ever buried in something and somebody sees that, they got a chance to help them out. Just a little side note. Flashlights. The ability to light a signal fire. Whistles. Bang on pots. Anything to make a noise. And know the SOS symbol. Do you all know that? All right. Do you know it? You don't know it. Dot, dot, dot. Dash, dash, dash. Dot, dot, dot. Everybody do it with their hands. Everybody. I am not going to quit this message until you do it with me. Everybody, go. <laughs> Teach your children that, to bang on any pipe or anything or scream it out because you have a voice too. And the best word in the English language for crying out for help is the word help. And so it is in our spiritual emergencies. Did you know your Bible is filled with SOS prayers? All right, uh, help me, Lord, save me, Lord, rescue me, Lord, deliver me, Lord. Even give us this day our daily bread is an SOS prayer. God, I need what I need today. I'm not asking about tomorrow. It's got enough trouble of its own. I need what I need today. I read it this way. The shortest distance between a problem and a solution is the distance between your knees and the floor. Isn't that good? But I like better when your knees are knocking, you kneel on them. My biblical precedent for that is Philippians 4.19. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So Paul says in Romans 12, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, and devoted to prayer. Proskartereo there, it's a wonderful word that means constantly. Devoting yourselves to prayer constantly. Keeping alert in it constantly with an attitude of thanksgiving constantly. See, when you cry out for help, you got to be quiet for a moment and listen. You keep screaming help or keep banging on something and you can't hear somebody responding back. You got to learn to be quiet in a disaster. Don't miss the spiritual principle there. Devoted in prayer, keeping alert. Opening your ears, your eyes, your senses with an attitude of thanksgiving. And so it is in a spiritual crisis. Prayer is our helpline. That's why devotion to prayer is a personal disaster survival tool for dealing with our resource-consuming needs. So how do we become more devoted to prayer? Quickly, my time's running here. We have to be around people who are SOS people. You have them in your life? that are constant in prayer. And secondly, pack your life with prayer reminders. One of the things I tell people when I've got a whole list of things and so forth, I say, have three by five cards with your Bible promises in them all over your bag, all over your disaster supplies, all over your house and your car or wherever tiger attacks come. Thy word have I hid in my heart. That's the best place to have it. One of my favorites is P-U-S-H, pray until something happens. So, quickly, I'm putting together an overnight camping event for my grandkids as soon as the weather cools down. We're calling it Pa's Backyard Survival Camp. And guess what, guys, you're going to learn. You already know this, because I told you. Purifying water, lighting a fire, making a shelter, cooking simple food, doing basic first aid, dressing for safety, tying knots like a good sailor using a compass, signaling for help, and even navigating by the stars. But here's what we're going to best teach you how to do. We're going to teach you how to improvise. You all know what this is, right? This is a survival tool. It is not a Diet Pepsi can. This can be used by filling it with hot rocks and putting it in your sleeping bag. This can be used as a water carrier. It can be used for so many things. But then there's this amazing little thing right here on the top. 
If you don't know how to tie knots, this will be your line tightener. Ah, it also can be a fish hook. These have so many things. I have 20 or 30 of these. I keep in my glove compartment, keep them all over. You'd be surprised what you can do. And I, and I call them nifty because that's grandpa language for that's really cool. That's really handy. And I say that because um, I want you to learn something. It's what I call the survival's rule of three. That we humans cannot survive three minutes without oxygen, three hours without shelter and harsh weather, three days without water, three weeks without food, right? And we cannot survive without an adaptable plan. But most of all, we cannot survive without hope. And you can't pack that in your go bag. It's got to be in your heart. So it is with the inevitable emotional and spiritual disasters that come our way. Spiritual survival rule of three, weak humans cannot survive spiritual disasters without rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, and being devoted to prayer. In other words, we pack in this bag a process for dealing with joy stealing hopelessness, strength depleting tribulation, and resource consuming needs. Romans 8, verse 35, 39, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or trouble, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we're killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. We are subject to tiger attacks. But in all these things, not some, but all, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we know that the ultimate survival plan for this side of heaven is what protects us from the greatest disaster on the other side of life. Spending eternity in hell, separated from the love of God that is found by faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, Father, we would agree with the words of the Apostle Paul. And we take this simple passage and we apply it to our lives and our hearts. Prepare us, we pray, in Jesus' name. God's people said. Thank you so much, Pastor. We appreciate that. And I encourage us, as we continue processing that as we go, there's nothing that can take away that hope in Jesus. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not. Desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages. Step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Hallelujah, hallelujah, 
Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me amen then came the morning then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to the silence, the roaring lion, declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh, God, you are my living hope. plan our songs like months in advance, had no idea what your sermon was going to be about, and yet I believe that it dovetails so beautifully with that sermon. Our hope is in Christ, amen? I, there's nothing that's like the Holy Spirit has to do that in order for it to happen. We find our hope, our never-ending, relentless hope in Jesus Christ. May that go with you as you go to this freedom weekend, 4th of July celebration, this relentless hope of Jesus Christ. As you go, you are loved. Say hello to someone that you haven't said hello to, someone new, and we'll see you next time.